This is a talk about a technique known as extensive reading for developing a very extensive vocabulary range. I believe that this is not only an extremely interesting and pleasant means of developing a very high range of vocabulary, it's probably actually the only effective way of doing so. This is a talk that I've given as a presentation at a seminar and that I've given as a workshop on numerous occasions now. And each time I've gotten positive feedback in the form of people saying to me that although they had known that extensive reading was a good idea, they hadn't really known why. And they also hadn't known how to either engage in it or how to encourage their own students to do it but that what uh, I had given them had provided them with that information. So, I thought it would be a good idea to make a video version of this talk. And here it is. Extensive reading and vocabulary range. First of all, what is extensive reading? In common everyday parlance, it's, uh, these are the normal adjectives, and you can just say extensive reading, wide reading, broad reading means reading a lot. Uh, but in language learning, it, it means something more specific and more specialized, and we have to contrast it with uh, another type of reading, intensive reading. Intensive reading is what we can call or refer to as assisted reading, and it's usually of relatively short and relatively difficult text. And when you engage in it, you're usually reading these for some sort of instrumental purpose. You're trying to get some information, or you're trying to do some actual learning through it. And when you uh, want to mark a text as intensive versus extensive, um, you're going to say that generally you're going to know less than 98% of the vocabulary in the text. And I will talk a lot more about this 98% level uh, throughout the course of this video. In contrast to that, extensive reading is what we might refer to as unassisted reading. And it's going to be of long passages generally, whole books, and we want them to be relatively easy. Um, we want this to be usually uh, for pleasure, for its own sake, for the sake of learning and enjoyment because you like reading that text. And incidentally, either if you have this knowledge or you know, you keep it in the background or encourage your students to do it, as I said, this is the, to me, not only the best means, but probably the only means of encouraging vocabulary growth into the highest ranges. And in order to engage in extensive reading, you need to have your initial lexical comprehension be about 98%. So what do I mean by assisted or unassisted reading? Uh, more than anything else, the assistance of a dictionary. But it doesn't have to be a dictionary. It can be, uh, if it's, it is a textbook passage or it's a passage that you're reading in a language class, it can be the teacher helping you through it. Uh, it can be some comprehension questions that can take any number of forms. Uh, extensive reading with unassisted reading means indeed that you're going to ideally dispense with a dictionary. You're just going to read and read and read and grow your vocabulary through the process of reading itself. Um, so since we're talking about reading and comprehension, let me uh, preemptively say uh, that I'm not going to discuss in further detail, but we're basically talking about vocabulary and words, and so I'm perfectly aware that there are many non-lexical factors that also affect your reading comprehension. And these can include such things as the grammatical constructions, uh, the uh, idiomatic constructions, that is, not only the individual words, but the way they come together to form idiomatic phrasings. Um, your reading speed is very important when you are trying to read an entire book. You need to have a certain rate uh, in order to get through it to, so you don't lose your attention. Um, it helps greatly if you're familiar with the content already, or at least with the subject matter. And also, for many books, uh, there are a lot of cultural and historical references. If you don't get that kind of thing, it's, it's very hard to continue along. And finally, most importantly also, uh, there are stylistic considerations. So how clear is the particular author's way of writing? What is his sentence length or his use of complex clauses? And things like that. Um, Hemingway is simply easier to read than Faulkner for reasons like this. So yes, all of these things enter into consideration when you're looking at a reading passage, whether you understand it or not. I'm, I'm sure that anybody uh, is able to remember an occasion when you would say, hey, I, I know all the words in this passage, but I have no idea what it means. Um, that said, though, 
uh, although these are important and uh, we can never forget them, uh, if you're looking at reading comprehension, clearly the single most important factor is your vocabulary, how many words you know, what words you know. So let's move on to a consideration of what we mean by a word, uh, defining the word word. The word word is a word that we use all the time and we usually just assume that we mean the same thing, but we don't necessarily. We use it in a number of different ways. Probably the most common way that we use the word word is in the sense of the absolute number of units of letter combinations in a text. This is a word token. We're going to refer to that henceforth as a word token. And this is what we find when we do a word count. If you go into Microsoft Word and you say word count, it'll tell you that there are a certain number of words in a passage or on a page. Uh, if you are writing an abstract, uh, you're often told that you can have 150 or 200 or 250 words. If you're a teacher and you give an assignment, you'll tell your students you want them to write 300 or 3,000 words. This is what we mean usually. A word in the sense of a word count is a word token. We can contrast that with a word type. And in this sense, we're using the word word, uh, not as a simple absolute number of combinations of uh, letters among the tokens in a text, but rather as different ones, how many individually different ones there are. So, to give an example of that, if I take a very simple sentence like, the cat ate the mouse. That sentence has five word tokens, the cat ate the mouse, that's five, but four word types, because we have one word type, the, that occurs two times. The cat ate the mouse. We have that same word two times. That's a word type. So uh, that's one consideration we can raise. How many different words, absolutely different words, we find in a given text. But a lot of words are related. So when we look at words in their relationship, we often come to another sense of the word. Word as something that you can look up in a dictionary. And in this sense, we call this a head word. Or a more technical word for that is lemma. And the plural of that is lemata. And we look at that, and a limita is not just the base form, that is the form that you can look up in the dictionary, but also the inflected forms, the plural forms, say, or the possessive forms of nouns, or the different verbal forms of verbs. So in this sense, most head words, or limita, have several word types, several different forms of the same word that will come in for them. Some examples of that are, well, if you look up the word book, you find the word books as well. If you look up the word man, you find the word men. You can't look up the words in a dictionary. You can't look up the word types, am, is, are, was, were, been, or being. These are all inflections of the base word, the head word, the lemma, of to be, be. So that's only one word, actually, in the sense of a head word or a, a lemma. And this is getting more and more comprehensive but the most comprehensive way of defining the word word is the following. It's as a word family. And in this sense, we're talking about a word in the sense of a fundamental unit of lexical knowledge, which, when you know it, you recognize and understand not only the inflected forms that come out of a, a base word or a head word, but also other related and derived forms, uh, other things that you could also look up in the dictionary. So this is a word family. And just as most head words or most limita have several word types, so also most word families have several limita. As an example, we can take the word, or the word family, for accept. So as a head word, that would come with accept, accepted, and accepting. But as a word family, it would also have acceptance, acceptability, acceptable, unacceptable, acceptably, and unacceptably. That is to say that if you know the word accept, if you know the meaning of the word accept, and you also know how the English language works, um, you might have to, when you don't know the word accept, you might have to look it up. But once you know what the word accept means, you won't need to look up acceptance or unacceptable. Uh, these come as part of the word family. So this is the most comprehensive sense of the word word, and this is the way I'll be using it throughout this talk. Even if I don't always make it more precise and specific, that's what I'm talking about. When we talk about words, how many words you know, how many words you need to know in order to read a text, we're talking about word families. 
So, how many words? What do you mean to, to know? To, to, what does it mean to know a word? Um, in order to know a word, there are three different ways that we can do that. Uh, the most, I suppose, the most desirable, the, uh, the most positive one is what we can call active knowledge. And this is when, as you speak or as you view as you articulate your thoughts and your feelings. Okay, it just comes out. It's part of your uh, active vocabulary, your active knowledge. And in contrast to that, we also have uh, a passive knowledge of words. And these are words that, well, certainly we can recognize them, and we understand them when we hear them, and maybe uh, we can even explain them. I don't, you come to me and you say, what does this word mean? And I can tell you what it means. But it won't come tumbling out of me spontaneously. If I'm sitting and scratching my head trying to think of a, a synonym, a more appropriate synonym, I might come up with it, but it's not going to come out of me in and of itself. Uh, so this is my passive knowledge. And then finally, in reading in particular, also in conversation, we have guessing knowledge. And this is uh, when maybe you couldn't define the word in and of itself, you wouldn't know what it meant without the context, but given the context, given the clues, you know what it means. This is what you can do when somebody says to you, what does this word mean? And you say, read me the whole sentence. And when you hear it in a sentence, you're, you're able to tell them what it means. So, uh, what is your reading vocabulary knowledge? It's the combination of all three of these, your active, plus your passive, plus your guessing knowledge. When we talk about your reading knowledge, your reading vocabulary, we're including all three of these, all three of these different types. So, uh, how many words do you know? How many words does a person know? How many words do you think you might know, you who are listening to me? Have you given it any thought? Have you ever uh, tried to figure it out? If you have, uh, probably the most common, uh, logical, common sense way of trying to figure out your vocabulary is something you can, I think, easily come upon by yourself. Uh, or perhaps uh, reading some book like uh, David Crystal's Encyclopedia of Language, uh, you'll find mention of it. And that is to take a dictionary and to take a page at random from each section, from each word, and look at how many words uh, you know on that page, and compare that to the total number of words in the dictionary, and try to find a percentage, and figure out your rough vocabulary size on, on that type. That's something you can do on your own, and that's not invalid, but uh, as we just went through, that will be measuring your knowledge of head words, your knowledge of limits, and the knowledge of word families is much more comprehensive. So if you want to know how many word families you know, the best way I know of doing that is to go to this site here. Uh, this is a site prepared by the University of Victoria at Wellington. It's a vocabulary size test. It's uh, very comprehensive. If you go to it, um, you can look at the information and you can find um, some other tests if you're interested in this kind of thing, other sites that have other tests that I've looked at and I've explored. But truly, this uh, particular site here uh, is the most comprehensive uh, one that I've seen. Basically, the way that it works is uh, it asks you 140 words, 140 questions. You're supposed to define them or say that you don't know what they mean. And basically, 10 of these words have come from each of different 10 different uh, word frequency lists. And based on your ability to answer this number of words, it's able to project uh, approximately how many word families you might know. Um, a test like this, uh, when you take the test, uh, like me, it's very easy to be somewhat critical of it. Uh, it's much easier to do that than come up with the test. And I have to say that when I uh, take this test and look at the uh, words that are in it, uh, I really wonder why they put some of them in there. In particular, I feel somewhat discriminated against as a speaker of North American English, and here I have to note that us uh, native speakers of North American English, we make up about five out of every six uh, native speakers of North American English. I, I would say there's a good handful of words on this test that are distinctly not used in North American English at all, whereas I, was only, I only noticed one that I thought, this is a word only a, a, an American would know, uh, no British or uh, Australian person would probably know this word. But uh, nonetheless, you can take this test and I think get a very accurate uh, idea of your vocabulary range. Um, when you get it, you'll get a uh, test, a, a readout, a result like this. Uh, when I took it, uh, most recently, I got to said I knew at least 28,300 English word families. And noticing the word at least here and reading it down a bit more, this is uh, a work in progress. It's a beta version. Uh, and right now, it's only able to accurately measure up 
to 25,000 word families, but they're developing it further and further. Each time I look at it, it's, it's more developed. And uh, this is something that actually I have been using as a diagnostic for my own students here at uh, RELC in Singapore. And I've noticed uh, it's quite accurate. It's quite consistent as a predictor of who the uh, students are who have a wider range, who are more expressive, who are better able to read material. And my students are, uh, most of them are English language professionals. The majority are high school teachers of English from Vietnam or Thailand or China. Uh, some of them have been university professors from Taiwan. Uh, so I think that I can say, having given this test as a diagnostic to hundreds of students now from Asia, Southeast Asia, that um, as a person without a professional user of English, the average that they get is about 7,000. 7,000 words is what somebody from this region uh, is likely to develop as a plateau level of knowledge of English. And the very best, the best ones that I've encountered have never yet broken the 11,000 mark. There have been 10,800, 10,600. And I have to note that uh, my own son, my older son, who is now eight years old, I asked him to take this test, and he got that same range, about 10,800. And granted, uh, well, he's, he's my son. I've fostered him, encouraged him to be a bookworm. That's what he loves to do. And so uh, he might not be a typical eight-year-old, but again, these students, they're not typical, uh, typical language users. They are language professionals, and they're the best of the best. They've all received scholarships to come here and, and study. So um, when you take this, you'll get the results of approximately how many words you know. And if you're curious to know uh, sort of what an average is, here's another article that you can look at of uh, looking at basically comparing the average uh, vocabulary of a, a, a university-educated native speaker, on the one hand, and of uh, highly proficient non-native speakers, people who immigrated and now live in, in Canada here, uh, for, uh, have, have been there for years, and are university-educated lecturers themselves. We're talking about uh, 16,000, 17,000 base words. Word family seems to be about the average that a highly educated either native speaker or a highly educated proficient non-native uh, speaker might attain. Often when you're looking at research here, somehow that gets rounded up to about 20,000, but if you look into the actual research, it's about 16 or 17,000 seems to be the average of, of what a person might know. So going back now to my slides and having considered that, that's how many words a person might know, uh, or how many words does a person need to know? How many, person, how many words does a person need to know in particular in order to read books? That's our main consideration here. And that is a twofold issue. On the one hand, there's the total number of word families that you know, and on the other hand, it depends on the difficulty of the text. For a given text, what percentage text coverage does that number of word families afford? And so here is where I mentioned at the very beginning the difference between intensive and extensive reading being the 98% threshold. Uh, why do I say that? Here's some research that supports uh, that claim here. Uh, it's uh, for some reason a PDF file that's not so clear and easy to highlight or read, so um, I'll read this here. It's from the Reading in a Foreign Language Journal uh, in the year 2000, and it says that uh, whereas when you know about 90 to 95 percent of the words in a text, some people can get it, but most can't. Uh, and so by doing analysis, uh, it seems that around 98 percent coverage of vocabulary is needed to gain unassisted comprehension of a fictional text. So there's some research to support this 98% level. And now let's do something else, something that I think I can do much better in this video format than I can uh, in a live format where I don't have as much time, but you who are watching this video, you can pause and stop and read these texts as I slowly scroll through them and talk about them. I've made a number of texts for trying to get at that either 98% level, or perhaps you'll feel you can read and understand a text with, I don't know, 97, 96%. Let's see. Uh, this sounds quite high, but it's right 
quite interesting when we look at the actual differences between, precisely between these higher levels of text. So one thing I did is I made a test paragraph uh, for reading comprehension. And again, I'll ask you to pause and stop the video and really give your time to read through these different levels uh, if you're interested in them. What I did here is I put different uh, blacked out words. Again, we have our guessing taken care of. We have our passive and active vocabulary taken care of. In a given text, um, you have already done these things. And so at 90% comprehension, for example, the one we're looking at right here, uh, it means out of 100 words, you don't know 10. And so when I ask people to read this live, uh, the first thing that happens is uh, somebody usually looks up very quickly and says, uh, rather surprisingly or happily, that uh, even with just 90%, they are able to get the gist of it. They feel they understand what it's about. And I don't doubt that. I think that with 90%, uh, you probably can get the gist of it. But uh, if you keep reading, you'll see that I'm not asking you to get the gist of it. That's not at all what I'm asking you to do. If you keep reading and going down to the end, when it's perfectly clear, you'll see that this passage says, um, now, this passage contains 100 words and none have been removed to give you 100% comprehension. Can you imagine reading a book in which the entirety of every page looked like this, such that you neither knew nor could guess at the meaning of this percent of vocabulary? Could you do so using a dictionary, or would the task be too tedious and frustrating? This is just a test passage, but it should give you a notion of how your understanding of a connected text containing the unfolding narrative of a descriptive plot or developing sequence of ideas would be effective. So now, if you go back and look at the 90% level, I don't think you can tell me that you could do that, particularly, as it says, every page of every book, not one paragraph, get the gist, but keep reading a book, don't pick up a dictionary, keep reading a story, keep reading a narrative, and get it, understand it. Obviously, 90% is not enough, even though that sounds quite high. And what I found really interesting when I first made this, and when I show this, I still do, is that it's precisely at the highest level that it becomes more pronounced. The difference between, I don't know, 90 and 91 percent is not all that great. But the difference between, well, 99 and 100 is great. 99 out of 100, of 100 words, you know everything on the page. But if you only have 99 percent comprehension, most books, small print, have maybe 500 words. That means you don't know five words. 98% our cutoff level means that you don't know 10 words. It's double that. And if you have 97%, again, just on its own, 97%, 98% comprehension might sound like, but 97% comprehension means you don't know one word out of every 33. And 96% means you don't know one word out of every 25. 95 means you don't know one out of every 20. So you can see your, effect, your, your uh, comprehension is really going to be effective, uh, particularly at these higher levels. And again, what's been proven by some research and by this here that I'm showing you to make your own conclusions is that this level here, 98%, uh, is a level that you need to have in order to keep reading without a dictionary. If you don't know one word out of every 50, if you just keep reading, you'll probably come to know a large majority of those every 50. But if you don't know one word out of every 33, you'll probably have a very hard time keeping reading, keeping with the thread, understanding it. And you also, even if you push yourself to do that, you won't effectively grow your vocabulary. Whereas if you keep doing it with this level, you will. So this is one test that I made. Another one is I took a, uh, not a text passage that I myself wrote, but a connected text passage of a work of nonfiction. This is uh, the introduction of The Life of Reason by George Santayana. And I broke it into 100 word uh, paragraphs. And with each paragraph, I consistently took another word out. The words I'm taking out, by the way, are what we call uh, content words, not function words, not the words that are on the first thousand list, not the prepositions or things, but nouns and verbs that are going to affect your comprehension. So if you can start to understand this uh, sort of philosophical but still popular language lecture at the 100% level, uh, keep reading. Again, please pause my video and uh, look at the text, which I hope is large enough for you to read on the screen now. 
and see what happens when you get past the 98% level. Again, the 98% is what has been tested and proven for many people, not most people, many at least, to be the cutoff level from which you can do this extensive reading. This is the level from which you can keep reading and grow your vocabulary without active, conscious, uh, constant recourse to a dictionary, whereas dropping to it, to this 97% level, to this 96% level or 95% level, is something that uh, your, your comprehension is uh, very, very definitely impacted. And this 95% level here is when I've given this, uh, not necessarily in a workshop or a seminar, but to people with a bit more time to look at it, I've never had anybody tell me that they thought that they could keep reading beyond this 95% level, text like this, uh, without a dictionary. It would get very frustrating. You wouldn't be able to keep the chain of thought going. But uh, if you care to, you can keep pausing the video and see what it looks like at 95, 94, 93, 92. 91%. I did this one all the way down to about uh, 80%, I believe. So you can see what a huge gap there is with 80%. And the reason I stopped at 80% is, uh, well, I'll get to that in a moment. It's a very specific reason I did that. But um, this is a text that uh, you should be easily able to find. Again, it's George Santayana's Life of Reason, but here's the complete text if you were uh, confused and you want to see what it actually says, I'll slow the, uh, I will scroll through this uh, a bit slowly as I move on to the final text. Again, this is a non-fiction text, uh, making a, a, an argumentative and expository uh, type text, uh, but we're getting now to what we really want to look at and what we really want to use for extensive reading. That is a fictional text, a novel. And so I took a text of a not terribly difficult, a popular novel, not a great book, but uh, a popular book, a good book, uh, Tolkien's The Hobbit. This is what a text looks like at the 98% level. Again, I have removed some of the content words, not the function words. I've removed nouns and verbs, and I put them, I blacked them out, because this indicates that you cannot guess at them from the context. You've already guessed at some other words. You've used up your guessing allowance. If you were to read this text, these would be the blanks, these would be the gaps. And yet, at this 98% level, this is presumably, and by experience, uh, the level at which you could keep reading this book. If you were to keep reading the book, and this was your level of comprehension, uh, if you didn't stop and look these words up in a dictionary, but you read through the whole book, and a little bit later on you came back and you reread it, a lot of these probably wouldn't be black anymore. A lot of these would be words that you learn by context, learn by seeing them over and over again. It would be Tolkien style, they would fit into the context of this story. And you would learn and grow your vocabulary because you had this level of comprehension, this 98% level of comprehension to begin with. Whereas, from these other examples that I've shown you, if you had less than this, you wouldn't be able to do that. This is the minimum, this is what's required. And here's the complete text, but uh, this is a very, one reason I chose it. It's a very common, well-known book, so you should be able to find out what it means without my scrolling slowly down through it. But I will do so just in case you want it all right here. So, uh, going back to my slides now, now that we've understood why we have this basic 98% threshold, uh, we can discuss uh, what do we mean when we say words and word families and word frequency lists? Uh, for convenience sake, there have been, there's been a huge endeavor to build a number, a corpus, for example, the British national corpus of many, 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 many thousands of words in the language and to break them into uh, thousand levels just for convenience's sake. And so here's a list of the 1,000 most common words in the English language. And by the way, as I scroll down through this, I forgot to say what I wanted to say for my own sake uh, in showing that uh, my vocabulary size test is I would love to know of a similar vocabulary test or any similar online test for other languages. I don't know of any for French or German or Spanish or other languages, but I would really love to. And if anybody knows of tests like that, for other languages, please uh, post a response. Let me know about them. Likewise, for these word family lists, these word frequency lists, I'm showing it to you now. And now I think I'll say for the first time in this video, 
uh, this is basically a, a two-part video. In <clears throat> this first part, I'm just showing you the um, sort of the theoretical part that I think you should be able to watch just once, or maybe it would be interesting enough to watch twice and get an idea of what I'm talking about. But I will stop this video at a point where I will pick up in the next video, and I will show you um, a tool, a site, a program, which includes all of these word lists. The one I'm showing you right now is the most common 1,000 words in the English language. Word families, as we see here, agree, contains agreed, agreeing, disagree, disagreeable, uh, all this kind of thing. It will have the uh, complete lists for the 14,000 most common word families, and it will have a, a program, a tool, for helping you figure out for any specific text, any book or any given text that you care to put in, exactly which of these words are contained in the text, which are used, and with what frequency. So you should be able to take any text and figure out how difficult it is. What are the words in it, and uh, what vocabulary range do you need to have in order to be able to read it. So let me go back now. Just uh, scrolling through, these are the 1,000 most common words in the English language. And if you look at this, going back, I think I can make my PowerPoint large again. Um, those 1,000 words that we just looked at, those first 1,000 word families, the most common words in the language, give you, on the average, about 80% text coverage. Text used very loosely here. It could be a, a written text, a book. It could be the transcription of a spoken dialogue. Um, it varies uh, for a difficult text, a poetic text, or a scholarly philosophical text. It might be down into the 70s. Uh, for common everyday spoken language, it might be closer up to the 90s. But on average, that list of just 1,000 words will give you about 80% text coverage of the English language. And the next list that I could show you, the second 1,000 word families, those give you about another 7% coverage. And the third thousand, third thousand most common word families will give you an additional 3% coverage. So this is a common fact that I'm now confirming. Uh, the, the first 3,000 words give you roughly about 90% coverage of any text, spoken or written. And again, that sounds like quite a lot, but as we just saw in some of my samples, that still leaves a lot of gaps as well. So continuing on about word frequency lists, um, and it's an interesting thing, you already see them uh, dropping down at this level from 80% for the first thousand to seven to three. It keeps dropping precipitously. Uh, each percentage of the next thousand, again, these are arbitrary, uh, convenient uh, ways of breaking it down, uh, it decreases rapidly and almost geometrically. So the fourth thousand families will give you another 2%, that's about a total of 92% coverage. The sixth family might give you 1,000. The eighth family gives you, on the average, just about 0.5% coverage. The tenth family, 0.36. The twelfth family, 0.25% coverage. And the fourteenth family is easy to remember. On average, it just gives you 0.14% additional textual coverage. So it's obviously the lower frequency words uh, that are going to be the most profitable and the most beneficial. But what you really need to develop in order to have a high-level vocabulary are these higher, fre uh, lower frequency words. So. These are some things to consider. If you have just these 3,000 words, these right 3,000 words, the 3,000 most common words, you're already at the survival level. This is sort of functional, basic uh, level. You won't ever understand everything that's said to you, but you should be able to express yourself. Then there are other things that we can add to this. There are all sorts of specialized lists, such as this uh, academic word list uh, that will uh, this is a list of another 570 words that are common to almost any academic discipline. And for any given academic discipline or any other specialized field, you can find other specialized lists for law or for medicine. So that if you have uh, 3,000 words and plus a specialized list like this, you can already begin to do specialized studies. Um, and then for conversation, if you have 6,000 words, when we're looking for this 98% coverage level, that'll give it to you already. So if you know about 6,000 word families, you should have 98% coverage. And then as the 7,000 family gives you about 1.5% coverage, and the uh, 8,000 gives you another something like that, uh, you'll already be at basically 100% level. 100% understanding of conversational spoken English doesn't go above that. 
and even with lower than that, because uh, in conversation you have body language and gesture and all sorts of other means of control, um, with uh, certainly less than 8,000, about 6,000 words, you should be fully functional in conversational language. But uh, in order to start reading, that begins at 8,000 or 9,000. And my reference for uh, both of these is the same uh, here. It's the, uh, this, lab, this article is in the Canadian Modern Language Review in 2006. And here we can see that uh, if we want 98% coverage, we need to start with eight or 9,000 for written, but we're adequate with six to 7,000 for spoken language. So um, these are some things, again, to consider, and it's obvious when we do consider them that uh, lower frequency words are much more common in writing than in speech. So they can only be acquired by reading. Again, to rephrase that, uh, obviously in a book you're going to find lots and lots of words that you're not going to speak. You're not going to speak them yourself, you're not going to hear them spoken, but you're only going to encounter them in reading. So what does this mean? In order to learn lower frequency words, uh, we need to always remember that by very definition, the lower the frequency of a word, the harder it is to learn. Whether you have a high frequency word, you hear it all the time, use it all the time. When you first learn it, you'll hear it again, you'll get reinforcement. It's not difficult to learn. If you want to learn a high frequency word, by, if you have any gaps, you can take these word lists and you can put them in sort of a, an Anki program or some other kind of uh, memorization program and uh, do those by rote, it's effective for the high frequency words, but it's not effective for the low frequency words because you get no reinforcement. You'll just learn them and forget them, not be able to use them or hear them. So uh, we're looking again at the 98% level, and I'll say here that uh, if you want 98% textual comprehension of a book, that is, you'll get it when you know about 90,000 words, 9,000 words, I'm sorry, on average. Um, and that means, obviously, a corollary of that, is that where does the other 2% come from? We want to have 100% coverage. We want to grow our vocabulary and we want to understand it. That other 2% obviously comes from lower frequency families, the 10,000th, 11,000th, 12th, 13th, 14,000th, and above these other families of uh, words. So, uh, while this 98% textual comprehension that we get from the higher frequency list, it's relatively homogeneous. Again, next time I'll give you a readout and we'll see. We use most of the word families in those thousand words in any given book. But the 2% that we get from lower frequency families is much more diverse. Every author has his or her own style. Uh, novels don't have the same vocabulary as books of history or philosophy, um, and so we need to have not only a wider vocabulary, but a more extensive, a broader vocabulary that's not going to be the same from book to book. So what does this mean? Uh, this means that, uh, in other words, uh, if you want to take any given individual book, and you want to say, not 98%, 99%, close to 100%, I want to understand it all, I want to read it all, Maybe you'll be able to read any given book, Oliver Twist or, or, or um, The Origin of Species. Maybe you'll be able to read that with 12,000 or 14,000 word families. But if you want to pick up both of those and other books, if you want to be able to read books in general, be really literate, be able to pick up and read a wide variety of different kinds of books at that high level with more than 98%, you want to grow your vocabulary, you want to have a grown vocabulary. You need to have, obviously, a native range vocabulary, and that we saw is at least 17,000 word families, and probably more. So, um, how can we do that? How can you learn these lower word frequency families? The only way to develop an extensive vocabulary is to engage in the systematic extensive reading of progressively more challenging texts. There's no other way to do it. Uh, when you start out, learning a language, uh, you can find things that are called graded readers, uh, that are generally uh, great texts that are rewritten to just use uh, a lower number of words, to be written for somebody with a 3,000 or a 4,000 level vocabulary range. But they don't usually go past that, and so what would be really good and really convenient, and what I think any language learning resource center that is particularly aimed not just at helping people begin to learn a language but really continue developing it to highly advanced levels, um, it would be really nice if they had, well, at least lists 
organizing books, saying this is a very difficult book, this is a less difficult book, this is a book that's appropriate if you know 5,000 word families, this is a good book for you to read if you know 8,000 word families, uh, actually have these books themselves, have a library organized of books that are appropriate uh, for continuing to grow your vocabulary through extensive reading. So. Uh, I'll say at this point that uh, that is the focus of my research right now. I'm using the program that I'll show you next time to try to get a good gauge of uh, how to rank books, uh, put books in different levels of difficulty so that they would be adequate and appropriate for extensive reading. And furthermore, if you like my videos, if you find them informative, then I would ask you and encourage you to go to my website at some point and read about my plans or my vision for uh, this kind of intensive institute for a language learning resource center uh, where I could basically do what I'm doing right now rather than the sort of peripheral type teaching that I've done all of my life, just really be concentrated on helping language learners find the uh, most effective and efficient ways of, of studying, studying habits. Um, in a resource center like that, I would have not only the uh, textbooks that I have for beginning the study of a language, but I would actually have a library of, of books organized in this fashion so that we could say, okay, we measure your vocabulary, we test you right now, we know that you have a 7,000 or a 9,000 range, uh, so you should read books that are a little bit more challenging. You should read books at this level to continue growing your vocabulary through extensive reading. But uh, since neither of these things are ready right now, I'm about to conclude this video uh, with the promise that I will make another one next week and post it next week on uh, showing you a tool, a program uh, that you can use in order to analyze any text, any book or any other text you want in order to find out precisely and exactly what is the vocabulary in that the exact words that are used, and to organize them by frequency so that we can total them up and look at and say this book is appropriate for you to read when you have this basic level of vocabulary. So um, that's my promise for next week. I hope this has been informative, and uh, as I said, I'll be back at that point to make the other one. Thank you for listening.